If you want to understand more about the mission of the church in the world, there may be no better illuminating image than the thread of boats in scripture. The first boat is found in Genesis when we learn the story of Noah and the ark. The boat is a huge part of this narrative, yet this story isn't just about a safe haven from the storm. It is also about a fresh start where creation springs forth from out of the boat. Moses' life was spared when his sister laid him in a small boat-like basket and sent him down the Nile River, later to be found by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is entrusted by God to fulfill the mission of bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. Later in the Old Testament, Jonah was called by God to travel to Nineveh in a boat to call the Ninevites to repentance and to warn them of coming judgment. It seems that sometimes the best way to stop a boat from going under is to throw a person from the boat. A boat can be extremely dangerous when you are headed in the wrong direction. In the Gospels, we learn about the disciples, a group of fishermen who were called by Jesus away from their boats to follow him out into the mission field. Still, they sometimes found themselves back in their boats. If they stayed in the boat for too long, they were met with storms and had petty disputes. Other than when he needed to travel somewhere quickly, the only time that Jesus stayed in a boat was to take a nap during a storm. Around the fourth century, the boat became a popular way to describe the layout of a church. The central aisle of Basilica Church buildings was named the nave because of its resemblance to the inside of an upside down boat. As a place of safety and security from disbelief, worldliness, and persecution, people could enter the nave and feel safe and protected from the storms outside. But you see, the problem is that a boat is meant for the open water. It was never intended to sit still in one place like a mere building. Just as boats are meant for going places, the church is also meant to go places. As a church, there is this nagging knowledge that things in the world are changing. We live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Now more than ever, we need to reignite a vision for the church as a group of people called to live on mission in the world. Perhaps the best way to think of the church's mission is as a vine. A vine is a self-making living system containing within itself all that is needed to both maintain and reproduce. The term for this process is autopoiesis. This means that a vine naturally navigates and works its way around and through obstacles. It replicates and multiplies itself all out of its nature and its being. It can't help but expand and replicate wherever it goes. The church should re-envision itself as a vine, a living system that is a network of processes in which every process contributes to the mission of the church. We must see with new eyes and work with new ideas if we are to allow for a living, thriving, autopoietic church. We will see Christ as the stem and his people as the branches. There will be a great dependence upon the Holy Spirit and its movement upon the church of today. Characterized by probabilities and potential, the church is a living organism, a vessel of the wily Holy Spirit that is moving and creating. The organizational structures of the past are fragile and failing, weakened by a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The future church will be a church that possesses tremendous tensile strength, a capacity to grow, to be autopoietic, and to adapt to its new mission context. To become this new church, we need a new vision and understanding to navigate new contexts and challenges with clarity and agility. The church must be pushed back into the water, into the mission field. It was never meant to just stay still for our protection, but to go out and expand its branches through autopoiesis. God is alive and the Holy Spirit is moving to make things new. How can we embark on this journey with God?